Sonia Gasser graduated in art history and museology at the University of Bern, where she is now a research assistant in the digital humanities. Her PhD, ah, sorry. Her PhD, Visualization and Communication of Digitized uh, Collection of Art, started in the doctoral program Digital Art History at the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University in Munich. She worked at the Grafische Sammlung of Kunsthaus Zürich and was responsible for the project Archives on the Move at the Digital Humanities Lab uh, at the University of Basel in cooperation with the uh, Kunsthalle Basel. Her paper, Das Digitalisat als Objekt der Begierde, was awarded with the Further Prize Kunstwissenschaft uh, 2020. Congratulations, and now uh, for you the floor. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And do we also have the presentation, maybe? <laughs> so, oh, okay. In my PhD thesis, I deal with the visualization and communication of digitized collections of art. The main question is how digital collections or the images and information in it can be presented online beyond searching records in a database. I understand digital images and textual work information, metadata, as material that can be used to create applications that serve museums to attract their public but also for doing art history with digital methods. The topic of this summer school is a good opportunity to talk about digital collections as a data source for creating interactive visualizations. The content of data visualizations and the arrangement of images depend on metadata in different, in a different ways, which I will address in this presentation. This includes to discuss how visualizations serve to get knowledge from collections and what the preconditions are from the perspective of data, design and research in art history. Um, how, oh, okay. Let's uh, briefly introduce some concepts that are constitutive for the visualization of digital collections. Ben Schneiderman formulated in the mid 1990s a mantra that characterizes visualizations for seeking information. Overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand. When a data visualization changes depending on user interaction, it is referred to as generative design. Applications that are designed to make the content of the database visible on the surface provide an overview of the entire collection. Mitchell Whitelaw speaks of generous interface in this context. By this, he refers to applications that present digital collections in different ways so that different relationships and structures in a collection are shown in a seamless transition between exploration and focused search. In this way, the complexity of collection is represented and allows different interpretations. It is also important to be aware that different types of metadata exist. And Chileland, for example, distinguishes administrative, descriptive, preservation, technical, and use metadata. These types of metadata cover several functionalities, and it also depends on the metadata that is used, what proposed uh, visualization can have. Complexity Lab at the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam. Past Visions was the initial project from which the open source application Vicus Viewer grew out and has been used for several projects in the meantime. Past Visions includes a collection of drawings by Frederick William IV of Prussia from the Prussian Fallacies and Gardens Foundation, Berlin Brandenburg. 
First, you see a canvas on which thumbnail images of each drawing in this collection are arranged in a vertical bar chart, which creates a timeline. This allows to have an overview of the entire collection and gives an idea in which period of time the drawings were made and for which years there are more drawings than for others. In the next step, a filter option in the form of a word list at the top can be used. Selecting one or several keywords from this list drops off the drawings which are not included anymore and arranges them below the timeline axis. It is also possible to zoom in, which allows to see the preview images and to read bio biographical information that is given for the orientation of the user to situate the drawings in different situations or stations in the life of Frederick William IV. It is possible to further zoom into the canvas or to select one of the images and this allows to inspect the image in high resolution and opens also an information panel on the right that includes detailed information about the work like a description or a commentary and also the work data or work information. What we have seen here is uh, first an overview, then possibilities to filter and zoom the collection to narrow down it to those drawings that are of interest. And then finally, uh, you can go to the individual objects and find the accompanying information. Many accesses to digital collections of art museums lead directly to the details on demand level by a keyword search. This is helpful in cases in which a user exactly knows what she or he is looking for. If the idea of what to find is not so clear, which probably is the case if someone just wants to get some insight into a collection of a museum, the other steps, overview and then zoom and filter are crucial. It is a different approach to accessing a collection and bases in the case of past visions on different aspects contained in the metadata. The arrangement on the timeline uses the drawing state and the quantity of drawings in the same year determines the height of the bars. For filtering the collection, the controlled added keywords are necessary. Further metadata in the sense of object information is not used for the visualization, but to be displayed on the detailed level. Alternatively to the timeline view, Vicus Viewer has also a simil similarity view with extracted metadata from the digital images. But I now want to show another similar example. Oh, that's one too much. Okay. <laughs> um, that's the Google Man Galaxy, um, an application that also considers metadata that first had to be extracted from the image material by using algori algorithms visualize the collection of images in a three-dimensional cloud. Google Man Galaxy has emerged from a project realized at the first Swiss Open Cultural Data Hackathon in 2015, and I was also involved in this group. But Matthias Bernhard has developed it further after the event. First, it was an application developed with processing, and it only ran um, Java based on, on it as a desktop application. And Matthias um, yeah, developed it afterward as a web application by using 3.js. The cloud you can see on the slide is arranged by color. It allows to view on the entire collection and uh, does a kind of sorting. On the top left corner, there are dark medallions with portraits, while on the right, standing figures against the white background are together. And at the bottom of the cloud, there are arranged landscape, landscapes.
not possible to access and zoom into a high resolution version of the image. But what can be done is to arrange the cloud also by other dimensions such as color, technique, description or composition. Um, the visualization of techniques is interesting, but also not the most adequate form of visualization. The cluster of each technique are too dense, so the images of one cluster can hardly be explored. While the arrangement according to technique and description is based on textual data from the collection metadata, color and composition based on metadata extracted from the digital images, using computer vision algorithms. So metadata that is useful for visualizations does not only have to be information that has been added manually to a data record, but also data fi files like images can serve as sources to extract metadata computationally. Ben Schneiderman distinguishes seven types of data and seven tasks in a visualization application. The structure of the data determines what kind of visualization is possible. A list of keywords, for example, is one dimensional data that can serve for search and feature, feature options as in Vicus Viewer. Diagrams or situating locations on a map based on two dimensional data, while the arrangement on a timeline requires temporal data. For the representation of data in a changing image cloud, as in the Google Man Galaxy, multidimensional data is necessary. And as we will see in the next two examples, complexity in the representation of data also arises from the combination of different data sources and types, um, or through the linkage of a vast amount of metadata that creates a network of data. One good example that uses different kinds of metadata is the MoMA's timeline and map. This application takes the exhibition data of MoMA's international program. The images with exhibition views are arranged in a timeline that serves as the, at the same time for the navigation. Dots in the map mark where in the world exhibitions took place and blue dots mark all the places where one traveling exhibition was on view. The map also serves for the navigation. The stations of an exhibition, um, they're quite small, but uh, I, oh, no, I, can't, I can't point it, but um, they're, they're directly below the timeline and they're also connected um, with the map. And on the left, the image gallery allows to see several exhibition views, including the captions of the images. And the short text gives some information about the artists, the exhibition and the curator. Digitized archival documents are directly linked as PDF. But what's not used here um, are vocabularies, for example, for the artist names, the places or the curators. So I want to go to a further project that made extensive use of vocabularies. The Institute for Medieval and Early Modern Material Culture of the University of Salzburg created the image database Real Online that shows in a pioneering way how a network graph can be used for cultural her heritage. The images are indexed in great detail and in a very structured way by labeling persons, gestures, objects, animals, plants, and techniques based on icon class and other thesauri. The data is modeled as a graph, which allows to investigate the semantic elements of the artworks in a centralized net network. The visual graph uh, you can see here shows the equestrian battle of Louis of Hungary. Um, created by the master of the St. Lambrecht votive panel. An edge with the label contains person leads from the central blue point, blue node, um, which represents the scene. Um, and 
leads directly to a, another orange node of the category person representing Louis of Hungary. And you can see on the screen the, the label of, of uh, Louis or Ludwig von Ungarn in German. Um, further edges with the label wears leads to different purple nodes of the category clothing that name individual garments. Such a structure of linked data makes it not only possible to describe the motives of artworks very detailed by metadata, but it becomes also very effective if the nodes are used to link the data across databases and therefore the collections of several institutions. Another approach than adding plenty of metadata to data record of an artwork is to use the images only and use computer vision to extract the necessary data. With Retriever exists such a visual-based image search engine developed by the computer scientists at the University of Basel's Databases and Information Systems Group. This search engine originally developed to find certain video sequences was extended to the search for images, including the collection of Kunsthalle Basel's photo archive. In contrast to conventional searches, the search input is not a keyword, but a sketch for finding the most similar images in the data pool. So um, collaboration and a view beyond the horizon of the own institute or institution is quite fruitful. <laughs> um, yes, as we have seen at the exam examples of collection visualizations, Metadata is used to represent both object information and the, it's also the underlying structure of visualizations. This means that different types of metadata are inherent in digital collections that serve for different purposes. Metadata that is not part of the object information in a data record can be extracted from image files by algorithms or enriched with information and linked to each other via vocabularies and ontologies. Furthermore, fundamental design concepts such as interaction with digital collections, generative visualizations, and the generous user interface have to be considered for convincing applications, especially if they serve as an access for a broad public to explore the collection. But also for scholarly purposes, interactive exploration of visualizations with changing appearance serves as a prerequisite for interpretation and gaining knowledge. A visualization alone, especially if it is static, has only limited significance. This means interpretation is still relevant. Knowledge arises in an interactive application in between different views when exploring the collection. Metadata-based collection visualizations have the advantage that they show structures and allow to gain an overview on entire collections. They contextualize different items in the collections to make them more understandable based on the criteria that are applied for this contextualization. Applications that use data visualizations make the exploration of a collection less static. However, they do not mediate larger narratives to users in the sense that an expert has brought in his or her knowledge on a topic to embed the objects in a broader cultural context. For storytelling, other approaches need to be considered. Nonetheless, these limitations do not diminish the usefulness of data visualizations as a digital method for accessing and researching dig digital collections in digital humanities, art history, and museums. And one final slide, um, metadata in digital collections serves not only to enable searching or browsing, but it's also constituent for various types of visualizations in interactive applications. It is therefore necessary that the museums are aware
whose interest in collection data, images and metadata goes beyond looking at the images and reading the work information of individual records. Museums should themselves use their data to create applications to, pre to present and mediate art also in the digital realm. Moreover, the data should also be accessible for reuse, which makes it a valu uh, valuable resource for research in many different fields. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I ask uh, Beatrice uh, Guba, uh, storytelling in digital space, new approaches for digital curation. Beatrice completed her master in art history and image theory at the University of Basel, specializing uh, in the mediality of uh, medieval sacred objects. During her studies, she collaborated on the exhibition project Das Basler Münster im Wandel at the Museum Kleines Klingenthal and joined the Kunstmuseum Winterthur after graduation. She decided to combine her interests to pursue a PhD in digital humanities, where she focuses on digital art history and visualization of cultural heritage collections. She's also research uh, assistant at the Digital Humanities Lab in Basel. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so um, welcome to my presentation. Um, so I just started my PhD um, like seven or eight months ago. And um, so far I focused mainly on um, curational practices. So that's what I'll be talking about before introducing you to the project at Digitales Schaulago Basel. Yes, so um, Cultural, as we have heard so, so often before now, um, cultural heritage institutions are increasingly converting their collections into the digital space um, as the pressure towards digitization and open access rises. And this was accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. So uh, how to handle and uh, take advantage of this massive and ever growing amount of data is a big challenge. So um, in the digital space, cultural heritage institutions face similar um, issues as research institutions when it comes to data quality, long-term storage, and life cycle management. Um, and data curation practices address these issues, but simply digitizing and permitting online access to cultural heritage collections does not ensure visibility and long-term interest in the data. Yes, so um, I will start by talking about what is um, curation. So quality, okay, yeah. <laughs> the term um, curating has its origin in the Latin verb curare, which translates, translates to maintain and to take care of something. And the application to professional field did not occur until the 19th century of the emergence and the institutionalization of the museum. So I will highlight some points in the history of curation um, and to make a certain point. So the role of a curator can be traced back to ancient Rome um, when Augustus placed uh, someone in charge to look after the public works. And later on, he established a whole board of curators um, who were responsible for public buildings and shrines. So very early forms of uh, ca uh, collection catalogs survived from this time period. Then we jump into the Middle Ages, where um, the most valuable and largest collections constituted the treasures of salvation, belonging to churches and abbeys, as well as rulers and emperors. So these objects were set up in the interior of the church in a very specific manner, and the most valuable objects were only shown on certain um, times at, for high holidays and liturgy. Um, so the objects are positioned to create connections to each other, they tell stories together, and it's very complex and highly intellectually curated, the interior. And it's also very staged very precisely with light, so there are books um, that actually say when you have to put which light, where are the candles. Um, then in the late Renaissance, the period of the Cabinet of Curiosity began to emerge in Basel in particular with the collection of Amelbach and Fersch, but also the last collection of Blattner. And you can see one of those exhibited in the uh, Historic Museum in Basel. So you see that it's 
and made of a very heterogeneous objects from around the world that sparked the interest um, of rich privileged individuals and of course it was also a demonstration of power to be able to collect and present these objects so some of those collections could be visited for an entrance fee and others um, were not open to public access and so only a small privileged circle has access to some of them and they were maintained and exhibited by the owners in their private homes mostly out of pure interest in these curiosities and often these were the, and then the foundation um, to the first public museums um, but they were also built from fertile art cabinets and some uh, museums uh, were created through public initiatives for example in Winterthur so this institutionalizes the profession of curator um, although it was initially taken over by the director and, and the archivists until a position of its own was created. Um, yes, for curator, this, con um, this uh, contains of collection care, long-term preservation, exhibition design, as well as the continuous interpretation and research on the collection. So I made this short historical digression to show that the core tasks of a curator are still very similar to the origins concerning the maintenance of collections, but there's also this underlying change that accompanies curation over time as well. So in particularly, when we look at the people who take on the role of curation, first in the office of the state, then by the church as a means of salvation, followed by rich, privileged individuals who have the means to create their own collection, and then culminating in the public institution when academics take on the role. So in the digital space, who is responsible for the task of curation when objects become data? So what is digital curation? Of course, you all know the answer to this, so I will be very quick. Um, digital curation involves maintaining, preserving and adding value to digital research data throughout its life cycle. This is the definition by the Digital Curation Center in the United Kingdoms. Um, so it includes activities from planning up to creation of data and also best practices in digitization and documentation. It secures access, it permits preservation uh, for research and reusability of data. Um, yes, so it stands for lifecycle management and bitstream preservation of data. Digital curation is um, accomplished by scientists, historians, scholars, archivists, librarians, just to name a few. So it's a very interdisciplinary um, and it's needed in lots of different fields because it addresses the technical challenges of data, which is very important to consider when digitizing cultural heritage to think about data standards and of interoperability and to create a digital experience of cultural heritage um, digital curation shouldn't be the only and sole factor to consider even though it's an important one so um, um, i want to talk about why it's important to digitize and show cultural heritage collections online and of course there's a lot of valid answers to this but i want to focus on one in particular um, which is the public and their right to their cultural heritage of course, I have to add a disclaimer to this. Of course, not all cultural heritage can be digitized and not all digitized content can be made publicly available because of re uh, copyright restrictions and other legal frameworks. Um, yes, so um, Gerhard Bond is a German art historian, a museum director, and he said in 1933 that without an observer, all works of art are worthless. Um, the museum is a place of gathering of equals. Um, so he is questioning the gatekeeper function of the museum. And in the same year, um, science theorist Otto Neurath published a paper with a very similar title, also Museums of the Future. And he states that museums should exhibit what the visitor want and find important and not the curator institution. So this change in thought starts to gain traction for institutions to welcome visitors as active users and not just empty vessels to be filled with knowledge. It's also a matter of retraining um, the visitor from being a passive consumer to becoming actively engaged, involved in their own experience. And this trend continues um, with, for example, with Eileen Hooper-Greenhill, um, the Emeritus Professor of Museum Studies, who suggests in 1994 a new model for museums in which curators and visitors actively discuss objects and uh, exhibition and discuss objects to create meaning together. So 
um, museums and galleries switch from being a place of teaching towards a place of discussion and interactions between all participants as equals. So it becomes a dialogical museum or new museology. And current literature shows that this um, discourse is still far from over. And for example, Leontine Meyer von Mensch, she's the director of the Museum of Culture in Leipzig, describes um, that we should see visitors or users as a community and not as a target audience. So she names three factors for public involvement, which are constitute of access, representation, and participation. Um, and she describes these as the keys for sustainable museum practices. Um, yeah, so my point is that the digital space actually represents an almost risk-free opportunity to explore democratization further without deconstructing the institution itself. So the digital can act as a playground for user representation to open access to collections so the public can contribute meaning to their cultural heritage. Um, and it can be as easy as letting the users save their favorite works of art um, in an online collection to create their own galleries and share them. And of course, the most famous example for this is the Rijks studio, studio by the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And all their content is open access and users are able to download high resolution images and are free to reuse this. And the institution even encourages the reuse and they annually award the best idea. Um, so in this case, it's truly the cultural heritage um, of the people and the Rijksmuseum was able to profit from this as well. And the visitor numbers are higher than ever. So when giving power to the public and questioning the role and gatekeeper function of the institution, um, museums fear to become obsolete, but looking at the Rijksmuseum, allowing the public's involvement actually strengthened their position as an institution. Um, and Bernd Arl, the general director of the National Museum in Stockholm. Um, he followed um, the example and also opened access to their um, images and objects. And he said that, that they are committed to fulfilling um, the mission uh, to promote art, interest in art and art history by making images from our collection an integral part of today's digital environment. Um, we also want to make the point that these artworks belong to and are there for all of us, regardless of how the images are used. So you can see an international trend towards this open data and cultural heritage. Um, but when we take a closer look at Switzerland in particular, um, you can see that it's not common practice yet. So um, let's take a look at how it is in Basel. So Basel um, represents one of the densest museum landscapes in the middle of Europe and it has a very rich exhibition activity and a lot of museums and galleries that offer contact with internationally renowned and influential artists and works of art. So I made this list here. So I, anal um, I listed the biggest institutions and I analyzed them how they uh, show their collection online. And you can see that only about 50% actually shows an online collection. And of those, only 50% um, allow the user to actually filter through the objects and the collection. And I put it in uh, more than three categories because some um, just have a list where you can click at sculptures and then they show you a couple of sculptures they want you to see. But if, if there's more than three categories, then it allows the user to actually search for something and yes, be more engaged. And only the Historic Museum in Basel um, allows you to download the high resolution images. For the Kunst uh, Art Museum in Basel, um, it's partially the case. Collections, there's only one case where we can actually um, participate or interact as users with the content. Um, which goes further than just filtering um, through the collection and only the Vitra Design Museum allows for this. So I'll first show you, um, uh, that's the overview, I'll come back to this. Um, this is what it usually looks like when you present, uh, when you look at all online collections. So it's just the ability to filter through. Um, and when we look at the Vitra Design Museum, you can see that um, it has highlights and you can actually store, like the same as the Rijksmuseum, you can store images and then you can actually share it and contribute to it. Okay. 
And um, one of the problems when we go back to the Kunstmuseum Basel, for example, so um, is that they adopt the analog practices of the collection catalog into the digital. So they uncritically adopt these analog practices, even though the medium is not simply a vessel to carry content, it, it has a vital role in the construction of any communicated message. So therefore one should always uh, consider the medium that which is used and then adapt and not just um, use the analog um, practices. So, um, yes, so let's get to the project of the Digitales Schaulage Basel. So um, the goal is um, of this research project to provide access to the collections over time and space to secure the cultural significance and at the same time strengthen the importance of Basel's collections internationally. So this creates a new way of accessing the objects that have accompanied the history of the city for centuries. So all, you can see that all of Basel's uh, state-funded institutions have agreed to join this project and they all will um, receive a prototype that is tailored to their needs um, and um, they are being built as modular, so all data is interoperable and a dialogue between the collections can arise. Um, yes. So a shaolog means to store and present objects, or in this case, data. So an important factor, of course, is digital curation and interoperability, which is provided in expertise by the Digital Humanities Lab at the University of Basel, as well as the DASH, uh, the Swiss Research Infrastructure for the Humanities. And the other factor, the art historian curation, is factored in through the curatorial expertise of the institutions themselves, which join the project, which represents a nationally unique um, starting point. And right now it's still in the very early phases and um, the prototype for the Museum of Ancient Art will be developed first. Yeah, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>